Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Are you ready for the next lesson? This lesson is uh, scheduled for April the 24th on Monday. So a couple of updates here. Um, there's enough information on this week's artist, uh, Vincent Van Gogh. So uh, it's only gonna be one artist this week, not two. So we have enough information. Uh, plus I don't wanna give you two the week before the midterm, because the midterm will be the following week, which will be May 1st. So I'll go a little lighter on you today, but it's gonna be really good stuff. This is really one of the, uh, should I say, crazier artists in personal life, which is what this course is about, getting you know all the strange things that went on. So uh, without further ado, my little routine here. Material, as I say, start the slideshow, go to the beginning. Okay, put this up to snuff here, as they say. Again, school code, HUM, Humanities 105, the intimate lives of the world's most famous artist. And again, I said it's for April the Fourth and week four. Okay. All right. Like I said, the week following will be our midterm. So we're really just burning right along here in 2023. Okay. All right. So there he is, Vincent van Gogh. And uh, this is a self portrait. He actually did this of himself, which again is another. As artists have told me, another skill level. There's you know, a certain number of people that can paint beautiful pictures, landscapes, but it is a more difficult skill than to just paint yourself, right? And, uh, I don't think he even had photos available at the time, so no multimedia to work with, okay? What he looked like. We'll start with our little familiarity part before we get into the true craziness. Vincent William Van Gogh, born March 30, 1853, and died July 29, 1890. Doesn't look like a long life there, does it? Just like early 30s, 33 maybe. And he was a Dutch post-impressionist painter. So you have to learn about the impressionist period and what was the height of art, not like last week when we talked about an artist in the Renaissance. So with posthumously, which means happened after, became one of the world's most famous and influential figures, Western art, history. And uh, as you learn more and more about artists, this is a very common theme where these artists with what now has been considered great technique and ability, when they were alive, they were not famous, but posthumously after their death, the big word, um, look at the level of respect that's given this person. But again, not during his lifetime. In a decade, he created about 2,100 artworks, including six, um, excuse me, 860 oil paintings, most of which date from the last two years of his life. I hope it wasn't <laughs> 859 for the last two years. Uh, they include landscapes, so like I said, different uh, painting abilities and levels. Still lives, don't move. That was a still life of him, his portrait 
and then just a straight portrait and self portraits and are characterized by bold colors and dramatic, impulsive and expressive brushwork that contributed to the foundations of modern art. If you don't know the word impulsive, right? It's just like saying it's an urge that comes to you and you can't stop it. You know, you suddenly have an urge to smoke, you suddenly have an urge to eat a donut, you know, but you suddenly have an urge that you have to go dancing in the street. Right, these are impulsive. Uh, not commercially successful in his career, right, like I had mentioned. He struggled with severe depression and poverty, which eventually led to his suicide at the age 37. So like I said, early 30s. Well, we'll give him late 30s, but he just got over the hump there, but did not make it to it. And unfortunately, these two we learned kind of go together he right severe depression many times leads to suicide and uh, Robin Williams or uh, Anthony Bourdain right chef and the uh, author uh, born into upper middle class family Van Gogh drew as a child and was serious quiet and thoughtful as a young man, he worked as an art dealer, often traveling, but became depressed after he was transferred to London. He turned to religion and spent time as a Protestant missionary. I didn't even know he was a missionary. I thought he was a wild guy. But that's another thing that you'll see a lot of times men or women tend to be what society calls very wild turn to some form of strict religion. So a lot of women have gone into a convent and this fellow be a missionary. So this missionary was predominantly Roman Catholic in Southern Belgium. He drifted in ill health and solitude to be alone before taking up painting in 1881. Have he moved back home with his parents? See. So he was 28 he moved back with his parents. Having moved back with his parents, his young brother Theo supported him financially. The two kept a long correspondence by letter. His early works mostly still lives. Depictions of peasant laborers, which means poor workers contain few signs of the vivid or bright color that distinguished his later work. In 1886, he moved to Paris, where he met members of the avant-garde, including Emile Bernard and Paul Baudin, who himself later uh, went to live in Tahiti, uh, and who were reacting against the Impressionist sensibility protesting it, like its sensibility. As his work developed, he created a new approach to still lives and local landscapes. His paintings grew brighter as he developed a style that became fully realized during his stay in Arles in the south of France in 1880. During this period, he broadened his subject matter, which is to say made it wider, variety, to include series of olive trees, so things he hadn't painted before, wheat fields, and sunflowers. Sunflowers is one of his most famous. Van Gogh suffered from psychotic episodes, which 
it's a scientific way of saying some crazy instances where he went crazy, acted crazy, and delusions, and a delusion is, you know, something that happens that you believe, but it's not actually true. So, uh, I, I don't know if these were caused by his drinking, or you can have drunken delusions like, uh, I don't know why, but when I was a kid, it's very funny. Nobody talks about it anymore, but when I was a kid, adults would say, you know, that they would get drunk and, and see pink elephants. I, I don't know why, but people also have delusions without any alcohol. My cat was talking to me about the stock exchange, you know, that didn't really happen. And though he worried about his mental stability, he often neglected his physical health. That's not good. He did not eat properly and he drank heavily. So see, like I said, I know he drank heavily, but they weren't saying here. Some of these were caused by his drinking or not. His friendship with Bogan ended after a confrontation with a razor. Bogan is the one who originally had the razor. In a rage, he severed or cut part of his own left ear. Uh, Van Gogh did this. Never found out why. He spent time in psychiatric hospitals, including a period at saint Preme, which was a famous French psychiatric hospital. After he discharged himself and moved to the uh, Auberge Rabot in auvers Moissy near Paris, he came under the care of the homeopathic Dr. Paul Gachet. Uh, homeopathic is not your traditional medically trained doctor, but doctors that work with them say like herbs and plants and any other holistic type medicine that they feel will assist people. His depression persisted and on July 27, 1890, Van Gogh is believed to have shot himself in the chest with a revolver Dying from his injuries two days later. We will go into that a little more in the story part. Uh, it's a little vague here. Uh, Van Gogh was commercially unsuccessful during his lifetime, and he was considered a madman and a failure. Those are pretty stiff reputations that you have. You know what I mean? Like if you're red, you know, this is a crazy guy, and then a failure, that's that everybody, oh, that guy's a failure, that's hard to beat. How the heck did he become one of the most recognized and famous artists of all time? Because he became famous only after his suicide. He came to be seen as a misunderstood genius in the public imagination. I guess, you know, it's kind of like a lot of people thought Michael Jackson crazy, you know. First time around with a lot of kids, little kids, and then he had a friend that was a chimpanzee. And he supposedly slept in some type of iron lung oxygen tank. And that's all without talking about how he changed his face. So that's how people felt at the time. And now people are just trying to say, well, he was just misunderstood, you know, obviously a musical genius. His reputation grew in the early 20th century as elements of his style became or came to be incorporated by the fog and German expressionists. So they started using his techniques and people said, wow, where did this come from? It came from a fellow named Bogan. I'm sorry, Bogan. Van Gogh, Bogan was his enemy. He attained widespread critical and commercial success over the ensuing or coming decades and is remembered as an important but tragic painter whose troubled personality typifies the romantic ideal of the tortured artist. 
And that's something if you're not familiar with that. Uh, <clears throat> it's a very common theme amongst artistic people that they are, you know, they have a tortured life or psyche and they struggle with things. But yet through this, they are able to create such beautiful works of art. And a similar parallel can be done with about uh, our comedians. Like I mentioned uh, Robin Williams a little while ago. Obviously, you know, on the outside, you say, I was one of the funniest guys I've ever seen, or the funniest people of his generation. But many comedians have suicide or a drug addict overdose and they say the typical clown laughing on the outside crying on the inside and they're able to create this laughter out of the struggles that they had in life pretty cool today van gogh's works are among the world's most expensive paintings to have ever sold look at that and his legacy is honored by a museum in his name the van gogh museum in amsterdam which holds the world's largest collection of his paintings and drawings. So, I mean, you pass away, you were not famous, and then later you find out your paintings are some of the most expensive ever sold worldwide amongst the world's top artists. And now you have a museum with your name, all for you. Interesting. Life is uh, strange. Okay, so this is a drawing from the book that I'm using. Obviously, they're going to have this big giant brush. Sunflowers were one of his important paintings. And his still lives, his artistry that he carried with him all the time. So... There you go. Does he look similar to the actual self-portrait? Okay. Risking his life for art. Not all artists do that. Vincent van Gogh, born in Groot Zildert, Holland, 1853, but died in Over sur france 1890. About 37. Even when I said at this time, people usually died in their 40s. He didn't even make 40. Dutch painter whose works in life are possibly better known than any other artists. Wow. And just step the way to get something. Okay. Go. All right, this is what most people remember about Vincent van Gogh. You ready? Here we go. One night, he and French artist Paul Gauguin had a bitter fight in the cafe. According to Gauguin, not uh, van Gogh, uh, van Gogh chased him down an alley, brandishing a razor. Now, Gauguin says that Van Gogh had the razor. Brandishing means showing it, you know, maybe threatening you with it. When Gauguin turned and stared him down, Van Gogh went home and used the razor to slice off, slice off the lobe of his left ear. That's the small round part, at the bottom of your ear. Um, interesting. So that's what, I mean, but uh, Gauguin said, so if one guy, I mean, if a guy's threatening me with a razor, I don't know if I can stare him down. I think he has the upper hand, but that's what Gauguin said. I don't care if that he had a razor. I looked at him really toughly, and then he just ran away and ended up hurting himself. So it's a very mysterious story. 
wrapping the earlobe in a handkerchief, he took it to Rachel, a prostitute, a.k.a. woman of the evening. He had befriended and said, guard this object carefully. So that's a strange, ooh, interesting look into his mentality. Uh, I would think that nobody, I don't know, times have changed, you know, because people do so much uh, piercings and modifications and surgeries. But back when I was growing up, people didn't want to damage their body in any way. And I'm sure it was even worse at this time. Uh, so imagine, I don't know what made him, if Gauguin's story is true, uh, cut off his lower earlobe. And then why wouldn't he, it's his, right? Why wouldn't he want to keep it? Instead, he gave it to this woman and told her, you have to guard it carefully. I mean, couldn't if he had guarded his own Hear a little more carefully. And uh, unfortunately, after doing that, she fainted. And he went home to his bed and almost bled to death. So that's another odd thing. If he didn't have any doctor's care, what stopped him from bleeding to death? And uh, another curious thing, I... Don't think I'm not a doctor, but I, I don't think that cutting off that lower earlobe could you could lead to death from that. Uh, if you you know you cut a vein in your thigh, something in your neck. We all know about people that cut their wrists. A lot of blood flow through there, but I don't think a lot of blood gets to the bottom of the ear. But anyway. But he said he almost bled to death. But two weeks later, he had recovered, apologized to Rachel, and was back in the most productive period as an artist. So look at that. He almost dies. He has a crazy fit. I don't know. It sounds like he had a fight with Gauguin. So, and then, you know, we've learned about his mental instability and going to mental hospitals so I, I you know if i was a gambling man i would say okay after he cut off his ear and he physically survived he's heading back to the mental hospital they gotta help him he's, he has depression but no he comes out of this almost dies they say and now he enters the most productive part of his life as an artist hard to predict these things. Okay, so we're here in the middle. The other thing many people know about Van Gogh is that his art never achieved recognition during his life. In other words, he never became famous when he was alive. Nobody recognized the greatness of his art. He sold only one painting out of hundreds of works he created. Can you imagine that? That's like, uh, let's put it into the realm of like an actor. They always talk about, you know, you go on these auditions. Like, I bet you guys didn't know. I know you know who old Sylvester Stallone is, and he's famous for Rocky. Uh, I just found out that he auditioned for the original Star Wars. And he tells a funny story about uh, how, you know, I thought I was trying to be in Star Wars, you know, and that uh, Steven Spielberg's like, I can't reach him. Uh, and I guess it was before Rocky became a hit, he was a struggling actor, and Spielberg said, I don't think anybody sounds or looks like you in the future, so look at that. So what I'm trying to say is here, what if as an actor, you go on thousands of auditions and, you, and in your life before you die, 
you only actually get one roll. That would be pretty tough. So that go with one painting sold them, yet they didn't become famous. So it's like, what if he had done Rocky? People didn't like Rocky. Sylvester Stallone dies. And a few years later, they would release it, and it becomes this classic. Pretty scary. But things like that happen. His younger brother, Theo, was often his only source of encouragement. He was ignored or rejected by nearly everyone else. Thank God he had a brother that supported him. This probably would have not made it as long as he did. But after age 28, once he had settled on painting as the way he meant to serve humanity, that's a nice way. That some people don't, uh, most people don't think about that. I mean, you have people on the scale from I'm just going to party and get high and do what I want to do to some people, well, I'm just going to work and I really don't care or I'm going to get rich and I worry about myself only. But there is a percentage of humanity that says, how do I serve humanity? Well, so upon this, once he settled on painting as the way he meant to serve humanity, Van Gogh never stopped, never stopped painting, poor man. He had tried being an art dealer, a bookstore clerk, a teacher, a lay preacher, which is like a preacher that probably doesn't graduate the seminary, you know, doesn't have all the qualifications, even though he knows the Bible. And a social worker among poor minors. So it looks like he always wanted to help people in some way. As an artist, he was almost entirely self-taught. That's another thing, like our last week's. How do you get a skill like that in yourself? It's fine. Um, I, I've said before, I, I don't have any artistic ability at all. And I think, uh, I mean, I know for a fact that I can have the best art teachers teaching me, and uh, I'm not going to have an ability anywhere near that goal. He was so time. It's like they say a lot of times people, again, I could mention Michael Jackson and his dancing ability, whatever. They feel that they're touched by God. God gives them these innate talents, and they can do things most other people cannot do. So even though he was so that he was always defying the rules. That's not good. He was rebellious. He always believed in himself. Somehow, despite hours of mental illness that sometimes made him depressed and suicidal, or he drew on cafe menus, books, and scraps of paper frequently walked into the countryside to paint, looking like a porcupine with easels. Easels are the little round trays that traditionally the painters could paint on and then put, dip their brush in the thing. And brushes poking out all over. Um, this drawing on cafe menus, books, and scraps of paper, uh, the Beatles were known to write their famous songs in cafes and restaurants on the napkins that were on the table. So a lot of art, artistic people have very similar qualities when you and I are just sitting there wanting to, or worrying about how good that burger is to come out of Bob's Big Boy and hurry up on the Cherry Coke. They're writing songs and doing artwork, okay? The privacy, the country was worth enduring the strong winds, irritating mosquitoes and crows that pestered him while I work or while he worked. Yeah, I, the person with no artistic ability. Um, so, like, I couldn't put up with this. Let's let's say you, let's say you give me artistic talent. I hate mosquitoes, and I'm not going to be out there in the middle with. Mosquitoes running around and a strong winds blowing my paint stuff everywhere. I didn't know that crows pestered him while they worked. Now, I don't know if they mean that the crows 
just made noise or that they physically attacked him. Now you might laugh and say, uh, oh, I have crows, I've never seen a crow attack anybody. Let me tell you two things about crows. I did work at a, uh, for a company many years ago in Seattle and we had a problem there where crows were attacking people women, men, kids, you name it. They come out of the car and some crow come out of nowhere and hit the lady right in the head with its beak and make a hole in her scalp. So I have seen that. So I don't know if that's what they meant there. The second thing I'll tell you about crows is being malicious. Malicious is, I, I don't want to call it evil because they're animals, right? But when you're malicious, it's like worse than just, uh, being bad. So one time I was coming to K-Town to work, I got off the metro and in the parking area, there was a injured pigeon. And I could tell because it was, it was on the ground and I was having a difficult time walking. And uh, on top of this telephone pole, a bro saw that and then flew down and was coming trying to attack the defenseless pigeon. And then I stood there and then the crow saw me and ran away. And I, I, I was very early, so then I waited, I got out of the way, the, the crow came back, and was trying to attack again until I came back out. But eventually I had to go to work, so I went to work. When I got out for lunch, I came back, sure enough, the pigeon was dead. And the crow had uh, poked out both of the pigeon's eyes. So uh, cur I'm curious how, how much these crows bothered him as he sat there day after day in the uh, forest trying to paint. Next page. Nearly everything Van Gogh did differed from how others behave. And people usually reacted to him with either laughter or fear. Villagers sometimes played practical jokes on the little painter fellow. Nervous priests warned parishioners or churchgoers not to pose for him. Interesting. And maybe they thought he was so crazy he would you know, injure them in some way. Children taunted or teased Van Gogh in the streets throwing cabbage stalks at him and chanting, which means singing and yelling together. He's mad, he's mad, so he's crazy. So imagine you walk down the street, a bunch of kids that see you all the time, start saying, he's crazy, he's crazy, and then throw cabbage stalks, probably the whole cabbage at him. Wow, that's irritating. Most people would have agreed with Van Gogh's description of himself as a shaggy dog, shaggy, too much hair. He wore scruffy clothes, which means dirty, usually a blue artist smock, which is a loose covering top, a furry overcoat and a battered or beat up straw hat, like you see from tropical country. Once he made a suit for himself out of lilac colored cloth with yellow spots. Must have been pretty bright and bizarre. Uh, at his best, Van Gogh was vague, which means when you're vague, it's hard to understand. Uh, someone asks you a direct question, you, most people would like a uh, direct answer, right? But if you're vague, like let's say I'm asking a girl out on a date and then I say, uh, you know, she should just tell me, no, she doesn't want to have a date with me. But I say, hey, how about this Friday we go out? Well, um, I'm not sure about Friday. 
And uh, then I say, well, what about Saturday? And she said, oh, Saturday is difficult too. And I said, I have no problem about the week after. Well, you know, consecutive weeks can be an issue. You know, I don't know. She's not giving me a, an exact reason. She's being very vague. The only thing I can understand after a while, if I'm foolish enough to ask for the next week and she does the same thing, I just realize the bottom line, she doesn't want to go out with me, but she's not telling me specifically. She's being vague, right? So he was vague and moody, so people could not understand why he did things because he would not explain them, like the woman who wouldn't tell me why she would go out that day. <laughs> and then with a tendency or a habit to laugh at inappropriate moments, that is also very strange. So let's say, let's say uh, he's your friend, right? Or you have a friend. Let's say it's going to be the first time you discover this in a friend. But you have a friend and your father just died Sunday. And then Monday you come to work. And this is a work friend of yours. And then your friend asks you, you look very sad. Well, well, what happened to you? How was your weekend? I said, well, yesterday, my father passed. Now, 99.9% .9 of the people, population, are going to say, especially this person who's considered your friend, I'm sorry. Oh, that's terrible. My condolences. But maybe Van Gogh would start laughing. So if your friend started laughing at this time, it's very inappropriate to do so, okay? which adds to his strangeness. At his worst, he was argumentative, which means he likes to argue, and stubborn. He's not going to change his mind, even if he's incorrect. Managing to alienate, which means make people not want to be with him. Almost everyone, no matter how good-hearted his intention. That's tough. Because probably this, this goes to his psychosis. Probably in his mind, he's like, I'm trying to be very kind and I do like you. But he can't control his strangeness. And nobody wants to argue. If he's so stubborn, everyone knows, okay, you made a mistake here. You should apologize. And he refuses. Uh, this makes it very difficult on, on uh, friendship relationships. Even Theo, which remember is his brother, who believed his brother was a genius, thought he could be his own worst enemy. And uh, I have known people like that. Uh, luckily, eventually, some of them realize that. They will say this exact line. They will say, you know, I'm my own worst enemy, and I've got to change. But until that time, if they can't recognize that, they're going to be like Van Gogh. Just add to a long list of people who stay away from him and think that he's too strange to put up with. Uh, the top here. That those attempts to marry never worked out. So he did have attempts. That's good. I know some guys that haven't had any attempts and they're getting up there in age. One landlady's daughter, uh, Eugenie, did not return his affection, nor did his cousin, he. I don't know why he was trying to marry his cousin. Maybe it's legal in France. I don't know. As long as she's a second, the United States' first cousin, it's not legal. Second cousin, that's different. And so Key, whose rejection of his proposal, which means he did ask her to get married, was definite and haunting scary no at no time never so that's like the, another old one that when i was a kid nobody says anymore but guys would say uh even on a date you know, if the girl was rude i would say hey i'd like to take you out on a date and the girls used to say uh, i would never date you or marry you even if you were the last man on earth okay, which i have not heard for over 20 years, so yeah. Um, so Van Gogh, he tried success unsuccessfully to form a stable family. I guess he 
deep down he wanted a family with a pregnant prostitute, CN, and her daughter. Well, he didn't care that she was a prostitute. He didn't care that she was pregnant with another man. And he didn't care that she had a prior daughter from probably someone else. So again, true intentions, kindness deep inside this strange acting fellow. The only woman to fall in love with him was Marco uh, Begemann, a neighbor 10 years older than he was. Out of sympathy for her, because at that time, older women, if they didn't get married very young, was almost impossible for it to happen. And men did not pursue older women. So he had sympathy for her. I, mean, I guess they're trying to say he wasn't really attracted to her, but that didn't matter. Because again, he has deep emotional ability. Van Gogh didn't discourage her infatuation. So that means he didn't tell her, please stop. You're 10 years older than me, I'm not interested. He did not, he let's let her continue. When their families intervened, which means his family and her family got involved, and I guess they said, hell no, you know, or the hells no, uh, she tried to commit suicide and the scandal rocked the village, which means just, you know, it rocked, it, it uh, almost tore it apart, I guess. Always desperately poor. It's probably another thing that women don't like. And marry a poor guy. He earned almost no money during his lifetime. But you know how valuable his artwork was later. Van Gogh was supported by Theo, his brother. Thank God he had a loving brother who supported him. And Theo became a successful art dealer. You know what she could have made selling uh, Van Gogh's brothers later? Um, Van Gogh imposed a condition of near starvation on himself and would go for days without food so he could afford to buy art supplies. So when that means imposed a condition of near starvation, it's like if you've heard the other term, he went on a hunger strike almost, you know? So uh, what he was trying to do was not spend any money on food and other things. He probably didn't take a shower. So this went on for days. So the money that he saved, now he can now buy art supplies. Remember at the beginning of the story, he dedicated his life to art. So could you do that? You know, from whatever your background is, uh, green student, and you get a green student and say, Okay, for the next four to five days, no kimchi, no rice, no bulgogi, no samjang, nothing. And the money that you would spend, you're going to buy art supplies because you love art more. I don't know if that's possible. You know, more American guy, uh, no McDonald's this week, no hot dogs, no pizza, no the what? But you'll have money to buy art at the end of the week. Sometimes he gave clothes and food away to those even poorer than himself. So again, look at this kindness. It's like, you know, I'm doing terrible, but I think you're doing worse than me. I can help you. I can assist you. When he did eat, his meals consisted of bread and cheese, which is probably the cheapest thing you can get at the time. He rejected meat by the most expensive sugar, and butter as luxuries. So he smelled meat, sugar, and butter for rich people. Though he did allow himself cheap tobacco for the pipe he always smoked. So either he did that because it was cheap or he already had some kind of little addiction to smoking or maybe both. It's not really great for the health. I'd rather have the meat. Uh, as a cook, he was undistinguished, which is a kind way of saying sucked. Uh, people who tasted his soup suspected it was made with paint, 
because it tasted so terrible. So imagine, that's one thing. If it did have paint in there, I get you. It's like crap. This guy's not separating the food from the paint table. But if it didn't have any paint, why the hell did it taste so bad? That's just, that's why they say undistinguished. So bad, Ben Go had insomnia, which if you don't know, means that you cannot sleep. You know, you go to bed at 11 and you're tossing and turning in the bed and it's 12, 1, 2, 4, 5, you just can't sleep. Rotten teeth, probably never brushed them. He eventually had 10 of them pulled. And constant upset stomach from drinking many cups of strong black coffee. Uh, because of not mentioning it is black paint also get into the black coffee. Uh, you know, why, why, if he's just used to drinking black coffee and he's not like me that I need cream and sugar, why is he having an upset stomach? I uh, suspect some paint got in there too. He lived as a vagabond, which is an old term that nobody uses anymore. And, flows into another term nobody uses anymore. It's like a hobo. But that just means a person that's poor and kind of, you know, three months they live in this one shack and then three months later they're in the forest and then four months later they're in a garage. So you're homeless, but you're traveling around to get different spots. So he lived as a vagabond, but among his few possessions, were some 400 Japanese prints, very expensive prints, which he pinned up on the walls wherever he was staying. So he wanted to see these beautiful Japanese prints, even though he himself looked like a shaggy dog, scruffy and dirty, but was able to see beautiful art. Very strange. Cared more about protecting his art how he looked. His works that he left behind were not valued by anyone who found them. They ended up lost, burned for fuel, that is fire. A lot of people burned uh, book pages, paper pages, and I guess so poor you'd burn a painting because of the oil in the painting or used to repair chicken coops or outhouses. So chicken coop is where the farmer keeps the chicken. Outhouses were the old country style, you lived in a house and then went out to some small, like a closet, opened the door and then there was a hole in the ground and you did your bathroom uh, ones and twos in there. So there's a hole in the outhouse or the chicken coop, just put up one of his paintings. You know, That's how they valued they were at the time. Just unbelievable. The closest Van Gogh ever came to having a piece of his own, or sorry, place of his own home, was a four-room rented house in Arias in the south of France. For two years, he lived in what was known around town as the Yellow House, a period of intense creative output, unmatched in the history of Western art, and that was from him. Besides completing almost a painting a day, he dreamed of starting a commune, a place where all people live together, or a large group of people live together, of contemporary artists with a skeptical Gauguin and himself as its founders. His buddy, his enemy, his pal. Already considered a misfit, which is a term meaning you do not fit in society. That's why you're a misfit by the close-knit community that found his melancholy or sad ways offensive. Van Gogh was even less popular after the ear episode. But the incident was reported in the local newspaper. Unsympathetic neighbors decided Van Gogh was not merely moody, but he was dangerous because he cut his ear off. They organized a petition to have him removed from town by then, Gauguin had fled, and Van Gogh knew 
that his commune plans were failing. He admitted to himself to an asylum 15 miles away. So he said, hey, I have mental issues, can you help me? And remained productive even there where he was allowed to have a studio. Over the years, many doctors have speculated or guessed about the mysterious nature of Van Gogh's breakdowns, which came and went like the seasons, interfering with his life and art. Besides various ear disorders, so probably caused to the non-medical taking care of his injury, the diagnoses have included epilepsy, schizophrenia, manic depressive disorder, syphilis, a chemical imbalance due to extreme sensitivity to light. These are all diagnoses or guesses what might have been causing this thing. And poisoning from occasionally swallowing its own paint. See, like I said, the black paint getting into his black coffee and then having a stomach sandwich. Normally it doesn't come from black coffee if you're a black coffee drinker. Many of these may have been made worse by malnutrition. He didn't eat well. When you choose, you know, bread over meat, you're not having fat in your diet for butter. It's kind of tough. Combined with overwork and too much drink, still hitting the bottle of alcohol. His favorite was absinthe, deadly emerald green alcohol, nicknamed the Green Berry, which could cause hallucination of the highest order. I still think this is illegal in the United States. You can go to France and certain places in Europe drinking. And for what I understand, Johnny Depp really loves his absinthe. Again, he was in and out of asylums until at the age 37, he borrowed a revolver, which is a pistol, went out into the fields and shot himself in the stomach. Using medical help, he died two days later. Neil's arm, so he suffered for a few days, just like when he was trying to heal from cutting off his ear, except when you shoot yourself in the stomach with a bullet, it's much worse. In his pocket was the last of the hundreds of letters he had written to his brother, stating, well, my own work, I am risking my life for it, and half my reason is gone, which means he felt he was only half sane, halfway to being insane. His suicide devastated Theo, who died six months later at age 33 from the effects of sorrow and stress. Johanna, Theo's widow, devoted the rest of her life to establishing Van Gogh's reputation. Within 30 years of his death, he was acknowledged as one of the giants of modern art. What a truly unbelievable story. Wow. Van Gogh artworks. Van Gogh considered the potato eaters his first masterpiece. It speaks of manual labor and how they have honestly earned their food. He wrote of the De Groots, the members of the peasant family who were his models. Unusually patient, they let him draw them over a whole winter, longer than he worked on any other painting. As he was often too poor to hire models, Van Gogh painted 22 portraits of himself, including self-portrait, this is what he called them, and severed ear. Van Gogh found one of his favorite subjects while exploring his beloved countryside, sunflowers. To him, they symbolized gratitude to his brother for support, to Gauguin for friendship, to the sun for light and warmth, he wanted to sell his series of sunflower paintings for a little badly needed money, about $80 back then, but had no luck. Nobody wanted to buy them. In 
1987, the piece known as Sunflowers, the same piece, sold for nearly $40 million. Although, um, excuse me, almost $3 million per flower. Crazy. Starry Night, considered by many to be Van Gogh's best work, was painted while he was confined to an asylum room. Never bored with what he could see out his window. Rises, which he painted in Asylum Garden, sold in 1988 for $49 million. The buyer called it the most important painting in the world. How can you not even get a dollar, my man, for your stuff? Years, years, years later, people are painting games. I want to $49 million. Man, what's going on in this world? Ah, on to the question. Shones. Question Shones. Chibon. Question one. What happened after Van Gogh and Gauguin fought in a bar? What did they do? Then they head off to a McDonald's and had a Big Mac, cheese quarter pounder combo. Two. What kind of recognition did Van Gogh's art receive during his lifetime? I think we answered that many times. It's a freebie. Three, why was Vincent sometimes depressed and suicidal? Or how did people usually react to Van Gogh in person? Why, why did he describe himself as a shaggy dog? Was it because his hair was too long? Six, why would Vincent sometimes go days without food? was a Buddhist, maybe not. Although he lived as a vagabond, which I defined, what kinds of items did he possess? This some possible diagnoses that might have caused his strange behavior. There's a list there, so again, it's a recorder for my new people that I haven't had me before. Let's say there's a list of six things. You don't have to write all six, but if you write only one, you're going to get the least amount of points. The person who writes two will get more points than you. The person that writes four, pretty good. So the more you write, but you don't have to write all. It's a big list. The better you'll be. And nine, how did Van Gogh? Yeah. All right. So that's it for this week. All right. So do your work. Next week, you shall have an easy peasy midterm, I think. Just listen and read and enjoy these videos. Okay. So I'll see you then.